So the book of Acts is the early church, as we've been talking about. Jesus has ascended into heaven. Holy Spirit fell upon them. God using them mightily. We see different responses to the word of God. Some receive it with great joy. We saw a thousand saved in a single day. And other times, though, when the word of God is brought forth, we saw persecution followed. And we shouldn't expect anything different. When we share our faith with people, some will receive it with joy. Some will receive it with questions. Some will be indifferent. And some just won't want to hear it. But that's okay because it's not our job to save anybody. God does that. Amen. But we need to be faithful to deliver the word of God, to share the hope that lies within us. In the last few chapters, Paul and Silas have been going from city to city. First it was Paul and Barnabas, and they went in opposite directions because of their disagreement over John Mark. But even in that, God multiplied the ministry. And now Paul and Silas have been going from city to city, and everywhere they go, they're getting some of the similar reactions. Some received the word with greater joy than others. And some places, we know they were thrown in prison, if you were here last week. And as they were imprisoned, the Lord set them free. The guard was about to kill himself. The chains had all dropped, but they didn't leave. And they refused to leave until those wrecking, who had uh, jailed them you know, publicly said that what they'd done is wrong. These guys had great boldness. In every city they went to, they never complained about the consequences of standing up for the Lord. They were always blessed that they were able to suffer for the cause of Christ. So that brings us to chapter 17. And if you have your outline there, grab it. Let's go through this real quickly and then we'll dig into the word. And this morning we're going to continue with Paul and Silas on their missionary journey. And we're going to see more divine appointments. And we're going to see different ways that people respond to the word of God. And my prayer is that we too would understand that those are the things that we should expect as we share the love of Christ with people around us. So Acts 17, I tell that responding to God's word. First thing we're going to see is the, the word of God is the same. Can we say amen to that? Amen. It's always the same. And you're going to notice that their message doesn't change based on the audience. One of the things I hear a lot as a pastor, I get a lot of emails, a lot of stuff sent to me, and they're always telling me a new way to reach people, a new thing we need to do. Oh, there's a new thing. I'll talk to other pastors. Oh, I read this new book. I've got a new vision. I've got a new... Let me tell you something. If it's new, it's not true. I don't need anything new. Amen. Let's just preach the same message that Jesus preached that John the Baptist preached, amen, that the apostles preached. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is that still true? Yes. And we need to be faithful to that. So the message doesn't change, but the way that people respond can. Different cities, different people, different circumstances, same message. So first we're going to see people resisting the word. It's going to go into the city of Thessalonica. They're going to go into the synagogue. They're going to share the gospel yet again, like they always do. A few of the religious Jewish people will get saved. A great number of the Greeks will get saved. Uh, uh, so many of the women in the city will get saved. But at the end of it, we're going to see that a crowd rises up and attacks them for preaching the gospel. So then they go to another city. We're going to see from resisting it to receiving the word. The Bereans, Berea. You guys have heard of the Bereans, right? We know that there's the famous line about the Bereans, that they studied to see if these things were so. So they were people of the word who studied the word. And when the word came to them, they received it with great gladness. And there was huge revival in the city. So sometimes we share our faith and nobody responds. Sometimes we share our faith and they respond in an angry way. And other times we share our faith and people receive it with great joy and they give their life to Jesus. And guys, it's worth a hundred people saying no and being angry to see one person get saved. Amen. Can we say amen to that? And so too often, because we're afraid of the rejection, we'll miss out on ministering to the one who was hungry and needs to hear it. And only God knows who that person is. And it's not always a stern exterior that means they're not accepted, uh, receptive to the gospel, because often the people with the sternest exterior are the ones who are most convicted. And so may we share the, our faith. So resisting the word, receiving the word, and then finally ridiculing the word. The last place they're going to go is Athens. And in Athens, these are the, the very intellectual philosophers. And Paul is going to go into these intellectual philosophers, and he's going to find common ground, but then he's going to preach the same message. 
And I think it's important that we find common ground with people we minister to. But common ground doesn't mean water down the message to make it easier to, you know, make it more acceptable to their way of life. We don't change the message for the audience. We find common ground so they will hear us. And then we give them the same message. Can we say amen to that? By the way, I got a text last night, an email. Um, you know, I'm on the radio now in a lot of places. And all the email said was, it was an email that went to my personal email because anything from the website does and it's all it said in the comment section was amen and then it said below it pastor you say this way too much <laughs> so I texted back amen <laughs> so there it is it is what it is amen all right responding to God's word let's begin there looking at resisting the word the word of God's going to go forth and again, we shouldn't be as worried about how well it's received. Again, be kind, be loving, be gracious, but let the Word of God do what it's supposed to do, which is transform people's lives. And let's not water it down. So it says there in verse 1, Now when they had passed through Amphilia, Am Amphilius, and Amphilius and Amphilonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So Paul and... Silas, having encouraged the brethren in Philippi, left and headed toward Thessalonica. It's a hundred miles away. We read verses like this, and you know, we just think, oh, they went to this city and that city. A hundred miles on foot, more than likely. How long does that take? Four or five days? And they're walking along, and you know what? As they would walk through cities, they would share their faith with individuals along the way. But God would direct them to a specific city, and most often, Paul would go to the largest city in the region, go into the synagogue and share the gospel with the hopes of planting a church there, and then having that church minister to the rest of the region. And so he would go into the biggest city, and Thessalonica is the largest city in Macedonia, and he's going to go there, and every time he walks right into the synagogue. Now remember, the synagogue is where the Jewish people met. And we, and by the way, I, you know, I was talking to one of my Jewish customers. You know, I have a full-time job. And he always calls me to wish me a Merry Christmas. And I tell him Happy Hanukkah. And he always says to me, well, you know, we're on the same side. I said, well, certainly I teach about a Jewish Savior out of a Jewish book every Sunday and every Thursday. Amen? It's, a, it's, our, it's the Messiah you've been waiting for, Mel. And he loves you, brother. And you know what? He's the Messiah. He's the one you've been waiting for. And I said, I hope you get to know him. And we, you know, just share your faith with people. So they're traveling along. It's very uh, popular in nation way, very famous. And as they're walking along, they go by some smaller cities, possibly spending the night there. Again, some small ministry may have taken place. But Paul was being led by the Holy Spirit to go to large cities to begin reaching the, in the synagogue. So he goes into the synagogue where the religious believers had already rejected Jesus. Remember in Jerusalem, they were the ones crying out, having, whipping everybody up to cry out, crucify him. They were the ones that were looking for a conquering Messiah. And when they didn't get a conquering Messiah, they went from Hosanna, save now we pray you on Palm Sunday to crying out, crucify him on Friday. Just in a matter of four days, they went from praising him because they thought he was going to overthrow the Roman government. And when he didn't, and they found out he was a suffering Messiah, not a conquering king at that time, they cried out against him. And some people come to Jesus based on what we want from him. Well, I'll give this Jesus thing a try, but he better give me that promotion at work. I'll give this Jesus thing a try, but he better help me with my finances. And I'm praying about my health, so I'll pray. And if you're really God, you better heal me of this, or I'm not going to believe in you. Guys, that's not faith. We don't put God to the test that way. Amen? We don't tell God what to do. You know, we cry out to him in faith. And does God heal people? Yes. And should we pray for that? But our faith in God should not be conditional based on what we want, but trusting that God knows what's best for us. Amen? So they go into the city and they go into the synagogue where these are people, many of whom had wanted nothing to do with Jesus, had rejected the gospel, and yet they're unashamed and unafraid to go right into that place filled with religious people and to stand up and preach the truth. Yesterday, my wife and my son and I were getting ready to go out to lunch and some Jehovah's Witnesses came up my driveway. And pray for me, I think I should have been kinder because I usually am a little kinder, but they came up and they tried to hand me the Awake magazine. They go, here, we have a magazine for you. And I said, well, you know what? I'll be honest with you. I don't need the doctrine of the devil in my house. 
I really don't need it. Uh, here's the reality. You guys are deceived. You're preaching a false gospel, and I just assume you leave my neighborhood, to be honest with you, because these are people I love and care about. I said, I'm sure you're nice people, but you've rejected the Messiah. You've rejected Jesus Christ. And they go, oh, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So here's the question. Is he God? Well, no, we don't believe he's God. Then you don't believe in the Jesus Christ of the Bible. Oh, we study the Bible. I said, you know what? No, you don't. You've been deceived. I said, I'm going to give you two verses. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And, the, and, then, and then in John 1, 14 it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Word is God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who's that talking about? That's Jesus. Oh, well, no, it says he's a God. Oh, so now you say he wasn't God, now you say he's a God. They actually believe he's Michael the archangel. And the one gal was trying to talk to me, and the other one just said, I don't think we're going to get anywhere here. I said, uh, not coming in my direction, we're not, because I know the truth. And guys, I, I do get frustrated sometimes, because it's sad that, that people will do more for a lie sometimes than we will do for the truth. Can we say amen to that? And, and, and I tried to be, and I, and I said, you know, I can't even say God bless you when you leave, because I don't want God to bless you. I don't want God to bless you because you're out preaching a false gospel. And you need to understand who Jesus Christ is. And you're going to stand before him one day. And you're not going to be one of the 144,000 like you think you are. And heaven's not coming to earth. It's a false gospel. It's a false doctrine. Uh, you've you've uh, predicted the end of the world 14 times and been wrong 14 times. If you're wrong once, you're a false prophet. Amen? Could have been nicer, I think. <laughs> But I just sometimes, you know what I mean? When people are speaking, going to my neighbors and preaching this lie, you know, I just, you guys are, you're deceived. And the one lady goes, no, we study the Bible. I said, no, you don't. You don't believe you can understand the Bible without the help of some guys in Brooklyn writing a magazine telling you what it means. I have the Holy Spirit live inside of me. Amen. Amen. And we're going to see that as they go into the city, they have a, they go right to the most religious people. They're not afraid. Guys, we don't need to be afraid when someone knocks at the door from the Mormon church or the Jehovah's Witnesses. We have the truth. We ought to, hey, praise the Lord for that. God just agreed with that. Amen. Let there be light. Amen. So Thessalonica, it's the capital it's the capital of uh, the Center for Business. It's located on several trade routes. It's this great city. And again, it was predominantly Greek, and it was controlled by the Romans. Do I need to put on my speaker thing or no? Am I good to go? I know that. <laughs> did I turn it on to record? I did. Okay. Praise the Lord. All right, verse 2. Then Paul, as his custom was, went to them for free, three Sabbaths and reasoned with them from the Scripture. Whenever we have an interaction with somebody, our opinions are irrelevant. Give them the Word of God. Can we say amen to that? Because they'll probably forget everything I said, but I, my prayer is that they remember the two verses I gave them. John 1, 1 and John 1, 14. If they remember those two verses and either one of them goes back and opens up the Bible and reads them, that's what will transform their life. And, and having an understanding of that, Paul went into the Sabbath three weeks in a row and he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Now, in, in this case, the Scriptures would be the Old Testament. And you do understand that the entire Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? I will make this challenge to everyone here yet again. I will buy you dinner if you can find me a chapter in the Old Testament that doesn't point to Jesus. Because they all do. I've taught through the Old Testament, every chapter points to Jesus. All the sacrifices point to Jesus. All the genealogies point to Jesus. Every miracle points to Jesus. All the prophets pointing to Jesus. He's the fulfillment. Amen? And so Paul goes in, common ground. Old Testament, and sits down with them and begins to show them that Jesus, well, where's the, where's the Messiah supposed to be born according to the Old Testament? In Bethlehem. Born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 4. Right? And you start going through the list, you go, go to Isaiah 53, and it speaks so clearly of the cross, Psalm 22. And you go through the Old Testament, and you sit there with him, and he's showing them the Word of God. And as he shows them the Word of God, some of them are going to receive it. And it would be worth it if it was only one. Amen? 
If they throw rocks at you, if they kick you out of the city, if one person receives it, it's worth it. The word reason there means to dialogue with them through questions and answers. And the authority from all Paul shared with them was always the word of God. Never his opinion, not the opinions of others, but God's word. I don't even like to quote other Christians. I like to quote the Bible. Amen. Nothing wrong with what other Christians have said. That's fine. What does the Bible say? The word of God is sufficient. And so Paul goes into the synagogue, already been thrown out of every city he's been in. He's already been stoned to death at Lystra and left for dead. Got back up, went right back into the city. He's fearless because he's filled with the Holy Spirit. So he goes into this religious center. He knows what he believes and why he believes it. So he's unashamed of it. I think the reason that we are afraid to open the door is sometimes we feel ill-equipped. And we feel ill-equipped because we don't spend enough time in God's word. Can anybody say amen to that? Man, what if they ask me where, where Cain got his wife? I don't know. What if they ask me a question I don't have the answer to? Can I encourage you? You know what you all can do? You can all share your testimony. Look, I understand where you come from, but let me just explain what happened in my life. This is who I was, and then I met Jesus, and this is who I am today. And I don't know about him, and I'm not trying to earn heaven. I'm a new creation in Christ because of what Jesus did for me on the cross of Calvary. We can all share that. Amen? So Paul goes into the synagogue, and he shares with great boldness. Verse 3 says they're explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. You know what? When we share our faith, Jesus ought to be in every sentence. Amen? It's this Jesus who I preach to you. It's not Christianity. It's not religion. It's not anything else. It's Christ. And so when you share your faith, point him to Jesus, point him to Jesus, point him to Jesus. And he says, look, he had to come. He had to die. It's Jesus Christ whom I preach to you. I'm not preaching you religion. I'm not preaching to you rituals. I'm not preaching to you all these other things. And again, some of them are fine. Some of the things that we do are fine. But guys, that's not what it's about. Because when we stand before God, he's not going to say, where were you baptized and who baptized you and what name did they baptize you in? Amen? Did you, did you tithe? God's not going to ask you. Amen? Did you, what, what version of the Bible... Oh, New King James. Oh, heretical. That's not what they're gonna, is going to happen. <laughs> What's going to happen is, what have you done with God's Son? What have you done with Jesus? Amen? Do you know Him? Do you know about Him? Do you have a relationship with Him? Paul's standing amongst a group of people who had all rejected the Messiah, and it did not slow him down from opening up the Old Testament and saying, He is the Messiah you've been waiting for. We live in a city that's... Many of us do here in Calabasas is 70% Jewish, and we love the Jewish people. Can we say amen to that? Amen. And we have a heart for them. We want, and God's not done with them, and they're still God's chosen people. Bless those who bless Israel and curse those who don't. The word there to preach, it says there he preached. You know, preaching, whom I preach to you. The word to preach is to announce, to proclaim. Paul was faithful to preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, which is the message of the gospel. The Jews had wanted an earthly king, and I'm so glad that Jesus didn't just come to overthrow the Romans. How about you? I'm so glad he came and suffered and died that all of us could have eternal life. I'm glad that he had an eternal perspective because he's God, and we too should have an eternal perspective. And he gets up and he's preaching to them that apart from Jesus taking his place upon the cross, taking all of our sin upon, our, uh, upon himself, and paying our debt in full, and then proving it from raising, by raising from the dead, there can be no salvation. Without the cross, there's no salvation. Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in the cross. They believe that Jesus died on a stake. They don't believe he died on the cross. And I asked them that question. Did Jesus die on the cross? Did he pay for your sins? Did he raise from the dead? Is he almighty God in human flesh? Or do you think he's Michael the archangel that came to earth? He's God! Here's what all the cults do. Make Jesus less and man more. Amen? The Mormons believe they're going to be God of their own planet, and the God of our planet used to be a man on another planet that was so good he got to be God of our planet. And they believe that Jesus and Lucifer, Satan, are brothers, and they had to fight over who got to be the Messiah of this planet. So I love the Mormon people. They're kind. They're, they're, they're loving. They're, you know, they're good neighbors. But they need Jesus. Amen? 
and they preach a false gospel. And Paul just goes right into the center of town, unashamedly, boldly, only in the power of the Holy Spirit, and again begins to preach that there's no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. Saved. Any, any gospel message whose focus is not the sinfulness of man and Christ's work of, on the cross of Calvary is a false gospel. Here's the gospel. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. Jesus is God. He came to earth. He took your sin upon himself. He suffered and died that you might have eternal life. He offers you the free gift of salvation universally. You must accept it individually. For you to be forgiven, you must recognize you're a sinner and ask the Lord to not only forgive you, not just to make be your Savior, but also make him Lord of your life. There's the gospel. Amen? Guess what? It doesn't need to be more complicated than that. There's the truth. And you go to churches today where they don't want to talk about sin because that's offensive. I hope you get offended every Sunday. Amen? Yes. Cross of Christ is a stone of offense. Amen? If you're offended by my personality, God forbid. If we're offended, if we're convicted, it's a good word. Amen? I need to be convicted. If I don't con get convicted, I don't grow. And so Paul comes in, preaching it. And he knows that the end result might be, they could throw rocks at me again. They may kill me. You couldn't threaten Paul with heaven. Amen? Amen. He'd already seen a glimpse of it. When he I truly believe, he, you know, he talks later in Corinthians, I knew a man who went up into heaven. And I believe that's when he was stoned to death at Lystra. You get a glimpse of heaven, you come back down here like, dude, they can't threaten me with heaven. I've seen it, it's better. Go ahead, throw rocks at me. I'm right here, I won't even move. I'm right here. <laughs> But he's going to preach it because he knows that heaven is better, because he has an eternal perspective. Lord, help us to have the same perspective when we reach out to the people around us. To love them enough, to tell them the truth. Do it in love. Believers in Acts were called to be witnesses of the resurrection. Again, if, if we preach a message that doesn't offend some, it will save none. Amen? If we preach a message that doesn't offend some, it will save none. Amen? I think that's a new Davism. That's going, I wrote that down. <laughs> but it's true. Because if we don't offend some people in the group, we won't share enough of a message that can bring someone to salvation. Amen. Amen? So if you preach the truth and you do it in love, some will be offended, but hopefully some will come to know Christ. Verse 4, And some of them were persuaded... And a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. So praise God, here's the, he preached the gospel with boldness and it produced fruit. Now just a few of the religious people got saved, and that's sad. But a large number of the Greeks got saved and some of the leading women in the city got saved. So a majority of the people that got saved were not the religious people. But some of the religious people got saved, but there was great fruit. Obedience to preach the word bore fruit. It says not a few, but a large number of the leading women, a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and some of them of the Jews were persuaded. The word, the word, the word, that's what impacted them. He didn't put on, he didn't have a, a, a smoke machine. He didn't have amazing worship in a light show. It wasn't stained glass windows. And, you know, and none of that's necessarily wrong. But he, the point was, what changed them? The word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by? Word of, word of God. And so he preaches the word of God with boldness. People receive it. People's lives are transformed. Praise the Lord. Guys, it wasn't Paul's eloquence of speech, but his exposition of scripture. It wasn't how eloquent he spoke, but how faithfully he taught the word. Too often we think, well, I want to go to a church with an eloquent speaker. Well, if that's true, you wouldn't be here. But, you know, an eloquent speaker where somebody's really charismatic, and that's kind of how we elect presidents. We don't care about content of heart, just how eloquent they are. And that's pretty tragic, isn't it? Yeah. But the reality is that it wasn't that Paul was an eloquent speaker. It's that Paul was faithful to exposit the word of God. He let the word of God out. He wasn't worried about being popular with men. He wasn't worried about being praised by men. He just wanted to be faithful to the Lord. And when he taught the word with boldness, that's what impacted people. It caused them to come to the end of themselves. Again, not the eloquent delivery that transforms lives. You know, it's interesting. I've shared this story before. Uh, John Corson. How many of you guys know who John Corson is? One of my favorite Bible teachers. Love him. Um, 
I know him somewhat. And, you know, he actually met his first wife in Santa Cruz where I grew up. And he had come and done men's retreats and stuff for us. And, you know, he said when he was at Biola University, they used to bring in guest speakers all the time. And they brought in one guest speaker that was a really good storyteller. And he told a bunch of stories and illustrations. And they all went back to their dorm that night. And they talked about what a great storyteller he was. Then the next guy came and he was really uh, fluent in Greek and Hebrew and he made sure he exposited it and he talked in Greek and Hebrew a lot. And, told him, and they all went back to the room and talked about how great he was with Greek and Hebrew. And then Chuck Smith came and taught on the love of God and they all went back to the room and talked about the love of God. Guys, it's not the charisma, it's not the, the way that the message is delivered, it's the content of the message that matters. My prayer is when people leave here, they forget our names and they remember his name. They remember the Lord, and they fall in love with Him, and it makes them want to read the Bible more. Amen? Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now watch what happens in verse 5, though. So people are getting saved. This is great. Great end of the story. Verse 5. But the Jews, who were not persuaded, being envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Now, isn't it amazing that there were those who received it and were praising God and they were born again, new creations in Christ and having a promise of eternity. And then there were others who were jealous because the crowd was leaving the dead religion to follow the true and living Savior. And those who are ahead of the dead religion see that as a threat, and so they want to silence the gospel. You know, the, we live in our country today where they're trying to silence the word of God. We don't want you to have your Bible in school. We don't have your, you know, don't talk about Jesus here. Check your faith at the door. Don't ever talk about... Guys, we don't check our faith at the door because wherever we go, we take the Holy Spirit with us. Amen. When you go to work tomorrow, you're bringing the Holy Spirit to work. Everywhere you go, God's coming with you. I had a coworker in San Jose one time. He was brand new with the company, and I had some Christian verses in my cubicle, and I was talking about the Lord, and he came over to my desk. It's his first day there. He says, I don't know who you are, but you have to keep this place secular. You have to check your faith at the door. You don't bring your faith in here. And I said, brother, let me, cl let me clue you in on something. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> and this one of my friends came around the corner. He goes, brother, man, that's Pastor Dave, man. You can't, <laughs> Pastor Dave, that, man, he's not going to, are you kidding me? And so I just started talking to him about the Lord and talking to him about the Lord. And he got upset and, and then he went and told the bosses and they came out and they're like, I go, you know, isn't it interesting that you can have a gay Johnny poster and you can have a Buddha in your cubicle and you can have a half, half, you know, clad women poster and all that's fine. But talk about Jesus loves you and people get upset. <laughs> Lord, help us. Amen? Amen. So what happens is they got angry and it was convicting. And so they went out and hired a mob. Look what the verse says. They went and hired evil guys. If this doesn't tell you where these religious leaders' hearts were, they went out and hired hitmen. They went into the marketplace and paid off evil people to try to silence the guys who were preaching the truth. That's in the Bible. Does that tell you where their hearts are? They're not looking for truth. They just don't want to lose their gig. They just want to, don't want to lose their popularity. They don't want to lose their position and their authority. And sadly, that's how most of the world's false religions are. People are in positions of power and authority. And even if the Lord showed up and told them, I don't think they'd believe. Because it would mean that I have to reject the position and the power and the authority that, I've been, you know, that I have as people follow me. It says in 1 Corinthians, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The gospel is always going to produce diverse reactions. Some people are going to come to a place of glorious salvation. Others will respond with indifference, but some will be angry, mocking, and even violent. And there's no other name that gets such a response. I've yet to hurt anybody riot because, or get angry when someone talks to them about Buddha. Nobody says anything. Jesus, all of a sudden. People talk, and no one says, swear to Buddha. <laughs> Amen? I mean, haven't heard anybody cuss by saying, Hare Krishna! It never happens. <laughs> Joseph Smith! Doesn't happen. But they take Jesus' name in vain all the time. Because He alone is the true and living God. Amen. And there's no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. So point number one, Thessalonica, 
People got saved, but there was resistance against the word. They got an evil mob to come out against them, to attack them. They went to the home where they were staying and tried to bring them out to the people so they could wreak havoc upon them. They came and attacked them. I'm, I'm going to have a chance in March to go, you know, most of you guys know I've been to India a bunch of times in Russia. And you know, I usually go, I love to train pastors who are planting churches. That's one of my favorite things. I'm a church plant by heart. I love that. And so I love to go help guys who are going to go plant churches. And so I was able to do that in India with up to 700, 800 guys at a time. What a blessing. You share with them. They go out and plant churches. And they're, you know, you feel like you're going to give them something. They give you something. They, they challenge your faith. They're going into villages that are 100% Hindu or Muslim, and they go in there, and when they get there, they dig a grave. When they get to the village, f say, I'm staying, and if you want to kill me, I've already got a grave dug. I'm not leaving. Amen? And we get upset. My neighbor won't talk to me because I talked about Jesus. You know, we think we're getting persecuted. It, there's no electricity at church on Sunday. <laughs> And the reality is that we have no idea. So I have an opportunity. I've been, I was called again this week to go to Vietnam and to speak to a bunch of guys in the underground church who are preaching in villages where it's against the law. And I'm going to get a chance to share with them how to study and teach their Bibles. And I know they'll minister way more to me than I will to them. But what a blessing it is when you have people that are just unashamed of the gospel. They're willing to lay down their lives for Christ. And evil men are coming against them. Do you think it's going to stop Paul and Silas? They head out of town. You know, I think that's enough. We've done enough for God. What do you think? I'm good. I think John Mark had the right idea. Just bail out when it gets tough. That is not going to happen. I've said this often. Paul, wherever he went, he started a revival or a riot. Amen? Either people got saved or there was a riot. And I love that brother. Amen? And you know what? He's a fanatic. You know how you define a fanatic? He won't change the subject and you can't change his mind. Amen? He's just going to keep preaching it. And you know what? Let's be fanatics for Jesus. Amen? So, continuing and resisting the word, it says there, look what it says of them. Here's their testimony about them. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. What a great testimony that is. They're trying to mock them. They've turned the world upside down. Well, the real reality is the world was turned upside down in the Garden of Eden, and they're just trying to turn it right side up. Amen? It was turned down when sin separated us from God, when we chose to reject the truth, when we chose to sin. That's when the world was turned upside down, and to get it back to where God wants it to be, they're preaching the gospel. But what a great testimony. You know, I would ask this of ourselves. Just think about this for a second. If someone was to ask about you, your coworkers, or your neighbors, what would they say about us? They've turned the, our neighborhood upside down for Jesus? Those are the loving, gracious, kind people in the, in, the, in the middle of the street who love on everybody and minister to people? Would our coworkers talk about our love for the Lord and our kindness toward them? What is the church known for today? For transforming the world or for being transformed by it? Amen? Some churches you can go to today, you wouldn't know if you were in the Elks Club or at church. Because the Word of God's not being preached. And we're trying to become more like the world. We don't need to entertain the world. We need to preach the gospel. And sadly, they're getting attacked for standing for the things of God. And we see that the... They've, but, but at the same time, they said, they've turned the known world upside down. May we turn Calabasas upside down for Jesus Christ. And Oak Park and Agora Hills and Topanga and all the cities that surround us, Woodland Hill, all these places around us. Lord, but may it start in our hearts first. Look to your immediate sphere of influence, your co-workers. Can I encourage you? Start praying for every, or your co-workers by name. Start praying for your neighbors by name. Start praying for unsafe people that you know by name, your students by name, people that get in your car. Wherever, whatever you're doing in life, pray for them by name. Pray for divine appointments and watch what God will do. And they had a divine appointment, and it doesn't mean it's always easy. What impact are we having on our homes, our neighborhoods, our workplace, our city? Guys, are we thermometers or thermostats? What does a thermostat do? It changes the temperature. What does a thermometer do? It just reflects it. I play we don't reflect the world, but we change it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Verse 7. Jason has harbored them. And those are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, There is another King Jesus. They accused that they had 
were preaching Jesus, and by preaching Jesus, they were committing treason because they were saying there's another king. Do you know, and I read this, and I don't know, I'm a church historian, so I, I like to give the credit where it is, but church historians say that as many as six million Christians were killed in the first two and a half centuries for refusing to say Caesar is Lord. Say Caesar is Lord or we're going to kill you, and they were willing to die. And we're, yet, we're afraid to say Jesus is Lord. Help us to be unashamed of the gospel, amen? And I, you know what? I have no king but Jesus. Amen? We honor those in authority. We pray for them. But we have one king, one Lord, one God, one Savior. Now what it's, look what it says, 8 and 9. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the cities when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So they bring a mob of evil men. They try to silence the gospel. They attack them. They try to strike fear into them. And when it happens, what is, Paul won't dial down the gospel. So they go to the house where he was staying. They bring the man out where, the, where they were living, and they threatened him, Jason. And when they threaten him, they finally say, basically, give us some money and promise you won't do it here anymore and we'll let you go. He basically bailed himself and bailed them out. The sad part is that the, the city is the one who was punished because now they're going to leave. Paul and Silas uh, did leave, but as we read in 1 Thessalonians, the church there was faithful to proclaim the word. Even though they left, the word stayed. Guys, if a man has to stay for the word to stay, that man has not given the word to anybody else. Amen? So it's the word of God that transforms lives. It's not a man, it's the word. So the first thing we see is resisting the word, some persuaded, and again, but unbelieving and envious Jews gathered a mob of evil men. Secondly, Berea receiving the word. It says, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Did they change their behavior one bit? They got thrown out by the last group. Because they went into the synagogue, and there's where the uprising came from. So they go to the next city. They don't even change their methods. They go right back into the synagogue again. You can't stop these guys. You know why? They have a sense of urgency. They have an eternal perspective. You can't threaten them with heaven. And they have a burden to see people come to know the Lord. Berea was 45 miles away. Another Macedonian city, a two-day walk. And again, do you think they had a conversation during their two-day walk? And in two-day walk, I think they would have, you know, been burnt out by repeatedly being beaten, threatened, imprisoned every time we go anywhere. But Paul and Silas did not even, didn't blink. You could have walked and go, dude, are we ever going to go to a city where they don't try to kill us? Dude, I mean, come on, man. You know, can we take a vacation? You know, we're walking along the Mediterranean. Let's just pop a tent here and hang out for a month or two. They didn't do that. There was a sense of urgency. They never allowed their circumstances to get them to dial down the calling upon their lives. And I want to encourage all of us. God's got a calling on your life. If you're born again, God's got a calling on your life. Can we say amen to that? And God's given you gifts. And sometimes we allow our circumstances to take our gifts and we set them on a shelf. And guys, when this time has come and passed, only what we've done for Christ will last and nothing else is going to matter. And may we use the gifts God's given us for his kingdom and for his glory. So they're walking along, verse 11. It says, There were more fair-minded than those in Thess Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things are so. By the way, if it's your Bible in your hand or one of our Bibles and you want to keep it, underline that verse. It says that they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. This is a great example for all of us. I pray that you don't run around on Sunday morning trying to find your Bible because you can't remember where you set it down when you got home last Sunday. Amen. When I was a youth pastor, I used to, kids would leave their Bible at youth group and I would just take it and put it in my desk and see how long it took them to figure out they didn't have their Bible. Sometimes I would give a youth group kid a Bible and I'd put a $10 bill in the middle and wait and see how long it took for them to find it. <laughs> Here's 10 bucks, let me know you found it. I, I give kids a Bible and a year later, I'd say, let me see your Bible, come here. You know, break, the, the pages are still sticking together. Dude, really? <laughs> Read the book, don't wait for the movie, amen? But this is a great example that once they heard the word, it made them hungry for more of the word. Amen? 
And so they began to read the word and study it daily. Because guys, don't take the words of men, it's the word of God. And check every man's word against the word of God, including mine. That's why I want you to have a Bible. Make sure I'm not making this up. Amen? Amen. Study the word of God. Verse 12. Therefore, many of them believed. And also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowd. So many people believe... It was the power of the Word of God. It wasn't what people thought or what people, you know, what do I think, but what does the Word of God say? How many problems would be saved if we just went to the Word of God for the answers? Instead of arguing amongst ourselves, let's just go to the Word of God and let the Word of God answer. But they preached the Word. It was fruitful, but with fruit came persecution. We're surprised when we face uh, you know, people that come against us, but we shouldn't be when we preach the word because Satan's not going to sit idly by while you make a stand for God. He's going to bring accusations against you. So the threats again, once again, came and resulted in brethren sending them away. Look at verse 14 and 15. Can you believe the guys in another city heard that 45 miles away people were getting saved? So they took some of their evil men and ran down to that city to chase them out? Lord help. Amen. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command from Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So Paul leaves. I don't think it's because he's afraid he's being moved by the Holy Spirit. God's not done. We're indestructible until God's through with us. And now he's going to go to Athens. And now we're going to see one of the most famous messages in the Bible. As Paul is going to speak to a bunch of philosophers and a bunch of people who think they know everything. And this is a city where it was said that it's easier to find a God in Athens than it is to find a man. They had thousands of gods, hundreds of temples, and every god they had was a god that promoted a sinful behavior and made them feel good about it. They had gods of drunkenness. Seriously, Baca, God of drunkenness. I'm going to go worship at, the, at Baca's temple. We call them bars today. <laughs> you know, they had gods of sexual immorality, Aphrodite, you know, where they had temple uh, uh, prostitutes. Well, I'm going to go worship at the... And they, what they were doing is they were trying to turn their sinful behavior into something that in their mind would please one of their gods. And though they had thousands of gods, they didn't have the true and living God. They have thousands of false gods. So we first we've seen resisting the word, receiving the word. Now they're going to ridicule the word. And this is what happens often when you bring the truth to somebody who is filled with themselves. Athens, the intellectual center of the world, recognized as the center of culture and education. And in their phil uh, philosophical and inter inter uh, intellectual pursuits, they had turned the city completely into a city of idolatry. Greek myths spoke of goddesses, and then they had their own revelries and ambitions and acted more like humans than gods and there was plenty of deities to choose from so it was joked again that there everywhere you went you could find gods it was hard to find men so now with the temple of Aphrodite the temple of Zeus Zeus was known for violence so if you're a violent man you worship at the temple of Zeus if you're someone who's caught up in sexual morality go to Aphrodite's temple if you're into uh, drunkenness then go to the temple of Bacchus and in the middle of that walks Paul it's called a divine appointment. Amen? And do you think he's going to water it down? No, but he's going to find some common ground, and he's going to preach with boldness. Look at verse 17. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue. Where did he go again? Synagogue. Goes to the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers in the marketplace daily with those who happen to be there. So here's Paul. He goes into the synagogue, and he preaches till the service is over, and then he goes down to the mall, the marketplace, and preaches there. Because you can't keep a, a man who's filled with the Holy Spirit or a woman who's filled with the Holy Spirit quiet. You can outlaw it, but they're going to do it anyway. And so even though he's been thrown out of city after city, he's been stoned to death, he's been left for dead, he's been thrown in prison unfairly, he's been beaten with rods. You know him, Silas, walking to the next city, dude, the rods, that was kind of rough. I don't want that anymore. That's not what happened. 
They counted it a privilege. So they go into the city, filled with all these intellectual people. He goes right into the synagogue, and then he goes down to the marketplace and begins to preach the gospel. Guys, it's not just preaching in front of a crowd. Most often it comes one-on-one. When we just take our time, when we're going about our day, and we have an opportunity. Paul didn't leave the gospel in the synagogue, but took it to the street. We don't check our faith at church. We take it to work with us. We take it home with us. We take it to the mall with us when we're Christmas shopping. Amen? Take the Holy Spirit with us wherever we go. Verse 18. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached them Jesus and the resurrection. Epicureans were atheists, who believed that there was no life after death, and their entire life revolved around the pursuit of physical pleasure. That sounds like much of the world we live in today. There's no God, and I have one thing in mind, pursuing pleasure. Wherever I can find pleasure, I'll go get it. If I have to destroy my marriage for pleasure, if I have to break laws, whatever I have to do, I'm going to pursue pleasure. And that was the Epicureans. The Stoics were the intellectuals. They believed in many gods, and their emphasis on self, they had an emphasis on self-control and personal discipline. And, and their work, they were works-based people. You know, they do good works. They became very prideful. They didn't see any real need for help, for help from God. And so it's interesting, of the Stoics, the first two Stoic leaders both committed suicide. So I guess that intellectual trusting in yourself thing didn't really work out. So the Epicureans, in, were, if they had a motto, would be enjoy life. And the Stoics... It was endure life. And Paul walks right into these two very diverse groups. We're smarter than everybody, and we know everything, and we're people of good works, and the people of we're all about pleasure, and don't, you know, don't, put a, don't rain on our parade. We want to do what we want to do. And Paul right, walks right into the middle of that. And when he gets there, filled with the Holy Spirit, and notice they mock him. They call him a babbler. What does this babbler want to say? And have you ever noticed how arrogant people become when they, maybe they got some initials after their name. Maybe they've been educated, nothing wrong with education, but don't put your faith in education, put your faith in Christ. And too often people think, well, I'm this, and I've got this degree, and I've got, you know, 17 earned doctorates, and I was back at uh, Watchmen on the Wall some years ago, and it was a, a group of all kinds of Christians that were there, different pastors, and they would introduce these guys, and it was nauseating when they would introduce these guys to speak, and they would spend 15 minutes talking about all the amazing things they've done. Oh, he's been this, he's been on the chairman of the board of this, and they go on and on and on and on, all these accomplishments. Here's the reality. Without him, we can do nothing. Amen? Amen? Sinners saved by grace. And so they look at him. Look at this guy. This little Paul guy. Who's he? This is idle babbler. What's he got to say? What degrees do you have? Well, by the way, Paul is probably more educated than all of them. But he would never say it. Amen? We know he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, right? Well, Paul doesn't come in and babble about, you know, try to have an intellectual debate to that, to that extent. But Paul preached Jesus in the resurrection. So different city, different audience, same message. Doesn't change it. Again, I get these things in the mail. Oh, to reach the upwardly mobile. Everybody wants to reach the upwardly mobile, by the way. They tithe a lot. Reach the upwardly mobile. And I never get anything about how to reach the downtrodden, right? Oh, they just take from the church. So they, they have these ways of reaching them. And you, you need to send out a, a, a questionnaire to the city you're in and ask them what they want in a church and then give them what they want. Uh, heaven forbid. Amen? Give them the word of God. Paul doesn't give them what they want. He's going to tell them what they need to hear. Now, notice what it says in verse 19. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. The Areopagus is in a place called Mars Hill. You ever heard of Mars Hill? There's an entire ministry right now called Mars Hill. It was dedicated to the god Mars, the heathen god of war. It was 337 feet in elevation. It was located in the center of Athens, and it was a place where they had the Supreme Court of Education and Religion met daily. And they did love to hear new things, because they loved to sit around and talk about things, and they were always looking for the newest thing. So when Paul came, what is this new thing you tell about? Because they were all about education. They were great thinkers, and they would sit around. And as soon as that thing became old after a week, they were looking for the next new thing. So they give Paul an audience, 
And Paul's going to take this opportunity and look at what it says there in verse 20. For bringing some, you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know these things that you mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing but telling each other to, to tell or hear something new. So all their time was, tell me something new. I'm looking for something new. I need something new. In the Christian church today, you, we had people flocking to Toronto because people were barking in the spirit. And then people running down to Florida because they were having, getting spiritually drunk and in drunk tanks. And then flying to this place and flying and looking for some new thing, some new experience. Guys, again, if it's new, it's not true. We don't need a new thing. We just need to be faithful to the good old thing that God gave us. Amen? Amen. Can we be faithful to this? And so they're looking for a new thing, and Paul comes in. It's a new gospel to them. They haven't heard it. Verse 22 and 23. Then Paul stood in the midst. So here's all these well-educated men in their robes, sitting there, very intellectual. And then the Stoics were there as well. And they're all there with their attitudes. And Paul walks in. Stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens... I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For I was passing through and considering the objects you worship, I even found an altar with the inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him I proclaim to you. He walks through and there's thousands of gods. And just in case they missed a God, they had an altar to the unknown God. Here's the God of drunkenness, here's the God of sexual immorality, here's the God of this, here's the God of that, here's Zeus, here's all these gods. Well, here, just in case we forgot a God, here's the altar to the God we forgot so we don't offend the God we forgot. Now, Paul uses wisdom because he walks through and he says, okay, let's start with common ground. You guys are religious. They're religious and lost, but they're religious. By the way, I noticed they had an altar to an unknown God. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about the God you don't know. That's Holy Spirit wisdom, amen? Usually when I talk to someone who comes to my door, I try to get a commonality. So you believe in God? Yes. You believe that you're a sinner? Yes. You believe you need a savior? Yes, okay, well that's our common ground. Now here's where we depart. Because you think you're going to be saved by knocking on doors. Or you think you're going to be saved by good works. But the truth is that Jesus died. But starting with common ground, when we can with people, and then bringing them the truth. That's exactly what Paul does here, is, is he's going to try to bring them to a place of understanding this God who they don't know. Verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Now, can you think about how popular that statement might have been in a city with 3,000 temples? You know all these temples you made and bringing me up to Areopagus up here and to this beautiful temple that you're so proud of? By the way, God doesn't live in any of these temples. That's not where God dwells. Uh, it's not how beautiful the building is. The church is not the building, it's the people. Can we say amen to that? I know you believe that or you wouldn't be here. And so he comes in and he shares with them and he just starts preaching the gospel. He says, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Remember, the Stoics were the ones who were trying to earn heaven by doing good works. The intellectuals were there. There were those who were lovers of pleasures who were running into these temples. He said, the God you need to know isn't in any of these temples where you're going and getting drunk and sleeping around, you know, and having sexual immorality. The, all these false gods worshiping, he's not there. And he's also not in your good works. He's just insulted everyone in the room in two verses. He's let them all know that everything you believe in is wrong. All these temples, waste of time. Everything you're pursuing, that's not the answer. Your good works mean nothing. Now again, he found a common ground. He's pointing to the unknown God, and he's going to let the Holy Spirit speak through him. The first thing that we see here in his message is he speaks first the greatness of God. Four things, I meant to put it in our outline, I forgot to. Sorry, this morning. First thing we, he talks about is the greatness of God. Every time we share with somebody, we should talk about the greatness of God. Amen? And he boldly proclaims it. He's the creator. He's the one who is Lord. Then he talks about the goodness of God. That he is the one who provides. It says there, he gives life and breath and all things. God doesn't need us. He doesn't need my intellect. God's not impressed with my SAT scores. Or how much money I have in my 401k. Amen? or how big my house is, or how much people praise me. None of that impresses God. God doesn't care about any of it. And we need Him. 
In him we have life and breath, verse 26. So first he talks about the greatness of God. Then he talks about the goodness of God. He's the one that provides all things. And now thirdly, he's going to talk about the governing of God, that he alone is the ruler. Look at verse 26. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, so also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by man's art or man's devisings. He's saying, look, all these other gods, the unknown God, the gods you don't know, all these other temples are not, are not of God, and he doesn't dwell there. There's no God there. Your good works won't save you. You following after these false gods, not good enough. Let me tell you about the greatness of our God. He created everything. He's almighty, all-powerful, and he created us all. The goodness of our God, he's the one if, through whom you have life. And then fourthly, thirdly, he talks about the fact that he's the God who's in control of everything. Isn't it good to know that our God is in control of everything? Nothing happens without going through his hand first. Our God is God. Our God is faithful. Our God is almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful, and he alone is in control. The Greeks felt they were a special race. They felt elevated by their superior intellect. Well, it's good to be Greek. You ever see the big fat Greek wedding? It's good to be Greek. Windex on everything. But it's good to be Greek. And there's this mentality, and you know, we, a lot of us, we can have pride in our heritage, and to some degree that's okay. But here's the reality. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, barbarian nor, nor Scythian, we're all one in Christ. Man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. If we should be blessed about anything, it's not who we are, but whose we are. Not my background, but who I am in Christ. And so he's letting them all know. God sees you all the same. God created you all. God's the one who put you here. God's the one who gave you the boundaries that you have. God's the one who gave you the language that you have. Anything you have came from God. God's in control. God's the ruler, not you guys, not you intellectual men, not you guys who think you've got it all figured out. God is the one who's in charge. Now again, he's already challenged that all their gods are false, that all their good works are nothing, and now he's letting them know that God is the one who's in control. Verse 27 there, he said, God is not far off. I love that. God's not far off. When I was in uh, Russia, one of the times we were handing out Bibles on street corners and we had um, a Russian Orthodox priest come out and chastise us for handing out Bibles. And then he started saying to us, you Christians, you, especially American Christians, you're all the same. You act like God is near. And we're just a speck of dust in this huge universe, and we're so irrelevant that God doesn't even have time for us. We're just little speck. I'm like, man, I'm glad I'm not going to that guy's church. But he's like, he, we're little specks of dust, and we mean nothing to God. We're nothing. You know, and you act like he's so near. And I had a, a lady who'd been praying for revival in her city for over 60 years. She was in her 80s. She was my tr translator. And she says to him, sir, do you read the Bible? I said, oh, this is going to be good right here. And she said, do you read the Bible? He says, yes, I do. And he said, what is one of the names for God? One of his names is Abba. And Abba means daddy. And daddy is never far away. Daddy is someone whose lap you can crawl up into. Daddy is someone who loves to hear your prayers. So I feel sorry for you if you think God is far away. You need to come to know Jesus Christ and you'll know that he's near. I'm like, I can just go home and let her. I mean, praise God. But that was their mentality, that God was far away, and he lets them know God is near to us. He's right here. He wants to have a relationship with you. He loves you so much, he'd rather die than live without you. Let's finish up. Then it says there in verse 29, Therefore, since we are offspring of God, I'll repeat this, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art or men's devising. He just insulted a whole bunch of people who were craftsmen and did nothing but make gods and said all that stuff's a waste of time. Then verse 30, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all every, men everywhere to repent. He's saying what you've been doing, you've been doing in ignorance. He's talking to the guys who think they're the smartest men on the planet, and he just called them all ignorant. 
And in your ignorance, you've done this. But let me tell you now, God is calling you all to repentance. That's boldness. Amen. That's preaching the gospel, unworried about how the crowd feels. He's not being angry. He used wisdom, the unknown God. But now when he has the wisdom, different, different group, different group of people, different city, same message. He gets back to the cross. Then he says in verse 31, Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. The next thing he preaches is the grace of God, the governing of God, the greatness of God, the glory of God. And now he speaks of the grace of God, that he alone is Savior. Speaking to men who thought they were so intelligent, God commands them to repent. And then he goes on to say to them in verse 31 there, he begins to speak about the resurrection. He's saying, every one of you, you think you're the judges, there's a day you're going to stand before the judge. You're arrogant and puffed up and feel good about yourself and you're, you think you're in charge and you look down on men. There's a day you're going to stand before Jesus and he's going to judge you. For every one of us in the room this morning, there's a day coming when all of us will stand before Jesus. Well, actually, we'll be kneeling. Amen? We'll be bowing. And those who say that, you know, I've got, you know I'm, I'm going to attack God. or quite, No, we're going to come humbly and broken before God. And he's preaching the gospel of grace. And as he finishes up, he says to them, And when they heard the resurrection from the dead, some mocked, while others said, Will, you, will you, we hear you again tomorrow on this matter? Can we hear you again? Can we come talk to us again? So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysus, the Aragopagite, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So he goes in and preaches it, and some people mocked him because he preached it. Others said, well, can you come back and tell us more? And some believed. Isn't that what happens anytime you speak to a group of people about the Lord? Some people are going to mock you. Some people are going to say, well, we should talk some more about this. And some will believe. Guys, there's nothing new under the sun. Amen? These three different responses, again, when the word mock literally means laughed. They laughed at him. Like, please. We're so smart, we don't need God. But a small group believed and were saved. Remember, our calling is to respond in obedience to the Great Commission, to go therefore into all the world and make disciples of all nations, knowing that when we share our faith, when people reject it, don't be surprised. Pray for them, love them, be kind, be gracious, but don't change the message. Just keep sharing it with them and do it in love. Some will ridicule it, but praise God, there are those who will receive it. You know what? Jesus would have gone to the cross for one person. Amen? He would have gone if it was just you. How can we not share our faith with every opportunity we get, knowing that even one person gets saved, it's worth it? Isn't that true? Aren't you glad someone loved you enough to tell you? Aren't you glad somebody loved you enough to get uncomfortable and share their faith with you? Praise the Lord for that. So in closing... Responding to God's word. We're going to see that varying results based on the conditions of people's hearts. Again, you're going to have different cities, different people, different circumstances, but the message should be the same. Some resist the word. They don't, they're not really going to want to hear it. Some are going to receive it, and they're going to search the scriptures daily. Can I tell you the greatest joy I have as a pastor is when I talk to somebody I haven't talked to in years, and I hear that they're still on fire for God. What a blessing that is. Amen. I know it has nothing to do with me. I got to be on the front row. I got a call not long ago from a guy that was in my youth group in Lancaster when he was 17. He's now the youth pastor in Ohio. And he called me up to tell me. And I remember when he came to youth group, he was a gangbanger, tatted up, attitude, sat in the back row, didn't want to be there, thought he'd never listened to anything. And then one week I shared the gospel. He got up out of the back row, came up to the front, stood in the front, ended up doing his wedding. Ended up uh, you know, pouring my life into this young man. And now he's, past, he's a youth pastor in Ohio. I hadn't talked to him in 10 years. And I'm just so blown away by the grace of God and the power of God. Because he's a young man that when he heard the word of God, went back and searched the scriptures daily. And grew in his faith and his walk with the Lord. Guys, the most selfish thing we can do is go to heaven by ourselves. May we take people with us. May we share the truth. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. You are indeed a great and an awesome God. Thank you for everybody's... Uh, just their patience this morning with all the circumstances we had. I thank you for what a blessing, what a joy it is to worship you. And Lord, I pray you'd give us supernatural 
love and supernatural boldness. Give us a supernatural love to love people the way that you do, to see people the way you do. May our hearts break for people that we know that don't know you. May we never be self-righteous. May we not be like these intellectuals in Athens. But Lord, may we be humble, recognizing we're one beggar leading another beggar to the bread. But Lord, I pray also that we would not be silent. Lord, we would love them enough to also be bold, to share our faith, to just speak the truth into other people's lives. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us opportunities to represent you. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Is he worthy to be worshipped? Let's worship him. Thank you.